Welcome to the Jobs and Economic Growth uh, Finance and Policy Committee. It is Monday, February 7th at 3 o'clock. And before us, we have Senator Pratt with Senate File 2677, Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund Loan uh, Repayment Plan. Go ahead, Senator Pratt. And I hear you have an amendment also. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I would like to move the A2 Authors Amendment. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Oh, Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Senator Pratt moves the A2, A2 Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The amendment passes. Go ahead, Mr. Pratt, to the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senate File 2677 is an important and timely bill for, Minnesota, for the Minnesota economy and for its workforce. Minnesota employers are facing a huge tax increase due to no fault of their own. All businesses were hit hard by the pandemic and the stay-at-home orders, and many had to lay off their employees during this time. We had an historic amount of volume going through DEED and the unemployment system. In fact, uh, our, our unemployment deficit is twice that of what it was during the Great Recession. So Senate File uh, 2677 allocates $2.73 billion from the general fund um, to do really uh, three things. Uh, one, repay the federal debt. Uh, the last numbers I saw of, of last Friday, we were just over $1.2 billion uh, in debt that we owe the federal government. Uh, and and that, that fluctuates a little bit uh, over time, but um, that's at least where we're at uh, today. Uh, repays over... Uh, it repays the interest we owe on that debt. As of Friday, uh, that was over $8.1 million, and we're, uh, it's going up $50,000 a day. So every day we fail to pass this bill, we pay $50,000 in additional unemployment insurance interest. And it replenishes the reserves to one point th what we expect to be $1.3 billion. Um, that's not our pre-pandemic level but it gets us to a very sustainable level that allows us then to reverse all of the additional assessments that were placed on Minnesota employers uh, during the first quarter of this year. So Deed sent out the statements back in December. Uh, those bills will be due in April, and we're trying to get this done uh, before those, those first unemployment payroll taxes uh, are paid. Madam Chair, uh, I see we have quite a long list of testifiers. Um, but, I, you know, I just want to say one thing. I'm, I think that the, the, the pandemic uh, really showed uh, how fragile uh, many of our families are in, in financial circumstances. And, and the unemployment insurance was there to cover them. It was there to make sure that um, we kept them out of poverty in many cases. We, every dollar that we're talking about the, the $1.2 billion in debt and the replenishment, every one of those dollars went to support uh, a laid off Minnesotan and help keep that family uh, able to make it through the hardships that we faced in the spring of 2020 and going forward. And so members, I, uh, I'm proud to say that uh, this has been a, a, a bipartisan bill. Uh, Senator Putnam talked to me today is going to be a co-author on the bill. And so we're pleased to have that be um, a, a bipartisan bill. It's a bipartisan bill in the House. Uh, Representative Pulowski will be uh, introducing it in the House today. And I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, um, we're, we're in lockstep here with the governor. This is effectively what the governor's requested as well. We spent a lot of time talking with Deed through the interim and, and glad that we could find that common ground in order to help uh, shore up our unemployment system and make sure that this is a benefit that's available to Minnesota workers if we were able to, if we, if we ever were uh, uh, to fall back into the situation. And Madam Chair, I'd be happy to take questions or allow testifiers to, uh, uh, to go in front of me. Uh, thank you, Senator Prant. Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and Madam Chair, if you want me to ask now or after the testifiers, I could go either way. Are you okay with me going now? 
Uh, Senator Champion, go ahead and go ahead okay. now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Pratt, this is one question that I've gotten over and over again. We understand the importance of the UI Trust Fund, and we understand that there was a number of small businesses that, you know, opened up the doors and, and, and would be hit here. But one of the questions that was asked of me, and I just wanted to get your impression about frontline workers, because, you know, there were a lot of people that were saying that we should do something with frontline workers and, and really put both in an equally successful position. Any particular reason, or can you share with us why frontline workers who also were committed during the pandemic and were, and were experiencing some real challenges during the pandemic, that, that this doesn't include both, the, the UI trust fund as well as uh, frontline workers? Madam Chair and, and, and Senator Champion, uh, thank you for the question. I think there's a couple of things there that I, I'd like to address. First of all, uh, frontline workers and, and healthcare workers that were laid off, particularly those that were hit by uh, the moratorium on uh, elective uh, procedures, did in fact collect unemployment insurance. They're, they're in here. Um, this is not a bill to compete with, with the hero pay or the frontline worker pay. That's not the intent here. And we could have taken up uh, the hero pay for the frontline workers that Senator Housley worked on last fall and come back and picked up, you know, those that, that weren't included, and we could have had that discussion, but we didn't. We held it up. So I'm not trying to trade one for the other. The governor on Friday mentioned he wasn't interested in trading one for the other. Um, I don't see this as a competing bill, and um, this, is, this is really about making sure that we shore up the system that it's and that it's available for uh, Minnesota employees should they, should they fall on hard times again. Question, Madam Chair? Senator Champion. Um, as pertains to taxes, you mentioned earlier that we know that uh, these small businesses uh, and other businesses were assessed back in December, and it looks like collection is going to happen in April. Can you explain how this bill addresses that issue? Because it's my understanding, once the assessment already happened, that those businesses are going to be required to pay whatever has been uh, put forward. So can you help me understand that? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Champion. So uh, the, the, uh, the, the notices of what the unemployment insurance would be went out to employers in December, um, and, and that premium was in effect as of January 1. Now, those premiums aren't due or those taxes aren't due until uh, April. One of, the, one of the reasons why I believe this is so timely is to give DEED a chance to recalculate what those premiums would be because we are, through session law and, and, and simply by replenishing the fund, removing all of the need for those additional assessments. And so we want to get it done before those first payments are made. Senator Champion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. So to that point, it is my understanding that D doesn't have the ability to do a reassessment or recalculation, or am, am I an error, or if there's something that you've heard that would allow D to do that reassessment if this bill goes through? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Champion. Um, I have not heard that from the commissioner, um, that you know, our, our language and, and, and the deed language is very, very similar. Uh, there's a, I think there's a few technicalities that we still want to work out, but uh, no, I have not been informed that we can't do that reassessment. In fact, the whole point of the timing of this is to make sure that we are not overtaxing um, on, the, on the UI premium. Thank you, Senator Champion. We will get to the testifiers. First up, we have um, in person Chris Gruhat. I hope I said that correctly, Chris. Thank you. Um, CEO, CFO of D&G Excavating. And then after that, we will have on Zoom um, Mark Erdahl from Red Wing Shoes. Each of our testifiers, uh, if you can keep your testimony to three minutes, that'll help us because we have a lot on the list here today. We've got 12, so um, three minutes. Um, welcome to the committee, Ms. Gruhat. I hope I said it right. Yes, yes oh, good. you did, Gruhat. Welcome. Go ahead and maybe turn the camera to you. Sorry. Just fine. the audience would like to see you. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee, for allowing me to be present at today's hearing. My name is Chris Gruhat. 
My husband Brian and I own DNG Excavating out of Marshall, Minnesota. DNG is a family owned business serving the Marshall area since 1979. Brian and I are second generation owners of the company, and our son David is lined up to be the third generation owner. Just a side note, our company was one of 12 finalists for 2021 Contractor of the Year through Equipment World Magazine and Caterpillar. We've also been members of Associated Builders and Contractors since our company's inception. We specialize in general and commercial excavation, processing, supply, and delivery of aggregate material, and underground utility services. We employ 34 full-time seasonal employees. This means that the majority of our workforce is laid off for five months due to lack of work. So I am coming to you as a high user of unemployment. This is strictly due to the nature of our work as we are unable to dig once frost settles into the ground. Regardless, the work we do is necessary and in so many ways. Because of this, we have the highest allowable experience rate at 8.9% assessed by Minnesota Deed. These are costs that we have built into our business operations. I received my letter from Minnesota Deed in December to say I was shocked is an understatement. The explanation that was included with the letter is misleading in my opinion. This is a quote taken right from the letter. If your UI tax was $100 before the additional assessment, it will be 114 with the additional assessment. What they failed to note in this example that the taxable base wages will be going from $35,000 to $38,000 in 2022. That itself is an increase of 8.6%. I'm a numbers person, so in order to see how these changes would impact our company, I built a spreadsheet, I have it with me if anybody wants to see it, with our unemployment history from 2010 to 2021. Really over the years, there have been no significant changes. We paid the most unemployment tax in company history in 2021 due to the federal loan assessment of 4%. The amount we paid for this most recent year was just short of $110,000. So I built another spreadsheet and I extrapolated everybody's wages. And I can tell you that based on last year's wages, figuring in both the increase in taxable base wage and 14% assessment, our unemployment tax will be almost $136,000, which is an increase of 24% for 2022. This isn't the only increased cost we are dealing with. Supply chains are strained and material costs are increasing substantially. This will either put us out of business or lead to substantial increases to our customers. We cannot just simply absorb these costs. I appreciate the opportunity to be heard regarding my concern and the real life impact this is having on our company and our entire region in Southwest Minnesota. I applaud the bipartisan efforts in working together to find a solution and finding other ways to cover the trust fund deficit without placing the burden on employers. And I would entertain any questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Ms. Gruhat. Thank you. Um, next up, we have on Zoom, um, Mark Erdahl from CEO, uh, the CEO of Red Wing Shoes, and then Troy Redding from Alley Restaurants um, can come and sit in the um, testifying seat. Um, Mr. Erdahl, I think you're all queued up, ready to go. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me uh, be here today. Um, my name is Mark Erdahl, and I'm President and CEO of Red Wing Shoe Company. Just to give you a little bit of background on Red Wing, we are a mid-sized family-owned company founded in 1905. The company is based in Red Wing, Minnesota. We're a manufacturer, retailer, and wholesaler of footwear and workwear. We employ about 2,200 employees with business in over 100 countries worldwide. We also operate over 700 retail units. In Minnesota, we employ about 1,000 employees. We operate three manufacturing plants, five warehouses, 18 Red Wing shoe stores, and one historical hotel called the St. James Hotel in Red Wing. Our corporate headquarters are based in Red Wing. We are the largest employer and giver in the city of Red Wing, and we also support three, four labor unions, three in the city of Red Wing and one in St. Paul. Our number one strategic imperative is to evolve our people and culture. We believe if we get the people and culture thing right, everything else falls into place. 
We have a profit sharing plan that distributes approximately one third of our operating profit to employees and every employee participates. As a family owned company, we do not issue stock and we, have, we limit our outstanding debt. And as a result, we have a pay as we go philosophy, which means that our investments in people, technology, community and infrastructure are determined by the cash that we generate and have on hand. So going back to a little bit about COVID, um, you know, April 2020 was a dark time for all of us. Uh, the uncertainty and fear of COVID was real. And within one week, our business declined 75%. And that was unprecedented in the history of Redwing Shoe Company. We were shutting down stores. Absenteeism in our factories was 70%. Employees, quite frankly, were afraid. Some had child care issues, some had health concerns. And we spent millions of dollars to ensure the safety and security of our people and their families. And we provided three weeks of additional EPTO to every employee. But because of our vertical integration, the sudden impact of our business was not sustainable. And we were forced in April of 2020 to furlough 50% of our workforce. However, we endured the financial security, we, we secured the financial uh, security of every employee through unemployment insurance and also by making sure they kept their benefits from Red Wing Chew Company. And combined with these two things, uh, we were able to survive and bring everybody back to work within three months. And I think it's just a great example of business and government working together for the common good of all. The impact of the unemployment insurance legislation will directly affect our ability to invest in 2022. Without passing this legislative uh, uh, bill, it will curtail our ability to hire more workers in Minnesota, make investments in new technologies to grow our business, and impact our ability to support the communities that we live and work. And with that, I appreciate your willingness to, to, uh, to come together and listen today. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for my time here today. Thank you, uh, Mr. Erdahl. You were right on three minutes. Thank you. Perfect. Um, <laughs> next up, we have Troy Redding, maybe it's Reading. Redding. Redding, Correct. okay. And then after that on Zoom will be Andy Wilkie. So go ahead, Mr. Redding with Alley Restaurants. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I want to thank Senator Pratt for authoring this, this bill. Um, I am a member of the Minnesota Hospitality Association uh, and here representing them along with my peers as independent restaurant owners and the owner of Ally Restaurants. We own um, three restaurants, one in Plymouth, one in Maple Grove, and then one at St. Paul Airport called Homeland's Table. <clears throat> Going into COVID uh, and the, the first shutdown, we had a fourth restaurant that lasted till um, July of 2020. Uh, and we closed our first restaurant then. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I've been uh, in this business for 35 years and um, have been an owner of my own restaurant now for seven. Um, I don't have financial backing. Um, I did this with a loan from my dad and uh, a friend of mine put some money into it and built a company. <clears throat> In 2019, uh, we had sales of $6.7 million. Of that, $2.5 million went out directly in wages. I had 141 employees at that point. <clears throat> By the time we shut down uh, and our industry got shut down, I was down to 25 employees, my salary, salaried employees. And I managed to keep them, keep them busy doing takeout uh, and doing the work that we paid other people to do. I kept all of my uh, salaried employees uh, on payroll and paid their full benefits for the entire uh, two years that we had shutdowns. Um, we got back to 79 employees uh, prior to the second shutdown, uh, at which point we laid everybody else off again. I'm currently back to 123 employees, and as I said, uh, in 19, we paid them $3.7 million. Um, it's been a tough road. Uh, our industry has been hard hit. Uh, we paid $5,200 in unemployment insurance in the fourth quarter of 21. Um, I am not looking forward to what we may have to pay in 2022. Uh, we just don't have the means to take any more hits. Uh, supply chain um, is, is a challenge. Inflation is um, 
a challenge uh, and then the workforce is a challenge on top of it. Uh, we need help. Um, I managed to get um, payment protection funds, um, but we've gone through those. So another hit would be devastating for not just uh, hospitality, not just restaurants, but my own as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Redding. Um, we've got Andy Wilkie up next, followed by Lauren Schothurst, uh, Schothurst in person. So Andy Wilkie, the Director of Business Development and Public Affairs, uh, Greater Mankato, you are next. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, my name is Andy Wilkie, um, Director of Business Development and Public Affairs at Greater Mankato Growth. The Chamber of Commerce and Economic Development Organization, serving 1,000 members in the Greater Mankato area, we're the third largest chamber in the state of Minnesota. We are partners with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce Federation and United for Jobs Coalition. Thank you for the opportunity to testify virtually today from Mankato. I'd much rather be there in person with you. I want to highlight for you how the Mankato economy is growing and why thoughtful use of state and federal funds can have a major impact on our economy. Our MSA's population is up 21% since 2000. Of the 32 MSAs in the upper Midwest, we have the fourth highest GDP growth, fourth highest population growth, and seventh highest job growth. We continue to be a regional hub for very large trade areas. We attract a workforce from an area that includes 22 counties in Southern Minnesota and Northern Iowa. We are a hub for medical care at a regional hospital and clinic system, education at our five colleges and universities that serve 26,000 students, including the second largest university in Minnesota. Retail, and this is important, we have the highest rate of retail spending per capita, more than all other Minnesota metros. This shows that we draw more consumers from surrounding areas than all other Minnesota metros. Employment, our daytime population increases 40% each day, and agriculture is at the core of our economy. We are the green sea. More soybeans are processed in Mankato than anywhere in North America. In Mankato, hundreds of businesses are still fighting to stay open, keeping people employed and serving customers, just trying to stay afloat. Our economy is stabilizing. However, many businesses are in a precarious position. Efforts should be made to avoid aggravating already challenging headwinds being faced in today's economy with a historic workforce shortage, an overwhelmed work supply, uh, supply chain, and increasing in inflation. At Greater Mankato Growth, we support legislature using existing state and federal funds to repay the state's federal UI loan and bring this fund to solvency. By replenishing the trust fund, businesses can avoid paying the additional assessment surtax of 14%. If the legislature does nothing and allows these statutory rates to increase, it will result in one regional bank in Mankato with 130 employees will see a rate increase of 130% versus last year more than $21,000. A local service provider will see a 240% increase from 6,000 to more than $32,000. Another wholesaler will see, also see a 240% increase resulting in additional $12,000 expense. These increases can best be measured by the number of people who will be impacted. Businesses may be put into a situation of delaying hiring, deferring wage increases, or delaying other investments in their businesses due to these significant increases. We urge you to support, we urge you to act quickly and support Senate File 2677. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilkie. Uh, next up is Lauren Schothorst with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. And after that, in person will be Matt Baumgartner. Go ahead, Ms. Schothorst. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Lauren Schothorst, and I'm the Director of Workplace Management and Workforce Development Policy for the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. I'm speaking today on behalf of the more than 6,300 businesses and half a million employees we represent, and also the Chamber Federation, which represents more than 43 local chambers and their 21,000 businesses, the Minnesota Manufacturers Coalition, which represents a wide range of individual manufacturing associations across the state, and the United for Jobs Coalition, which represents nearly 80 organizations and their hundreds of thousands of employees. I am joined by some of these colleagues and businesses here today. We are here to ask that the legislature take immediate action to stabilize and restore Minnesota's UI Trust Fund from double digit UI payroll tax increases associated with a COVID-19 pandemic that are due in just a few short weeks. You've heard stories about what these payroll tax increases actually look like. 
one organization in the Twin Cities with less than 50 employees will see a 53% increase. An engineering firm in the seven county metro area will see a $90,000 increase in their UI assessment from what they are currently paying. And as you heard earlier, an excavating company in greater Minnesota that already pays over $100,000 a year in UI taxes will see their bill go up by tens of thousands of dollars. Private sector businesses are Minnesota's economic engine, providing opportunity and quality of life for citizens across our state. They have weathered a nearly two year storm of constant uncertainty, taking every step possible to keep their businesses afloat and their employees and customers safe, healthy, and employed. They continue to grapple with a disrupted supply chain, inflation, and the work workforce shortage in a generation. Employers statewide are in fierce competition for workers which means they are already increasing wages, enhancing benefits, providing tuition assistance, training, professional development, offering greater employee flexibility, remote work, and childcare subsidies, signing bonuses, and more. Double-digit payroll tax increases make offering those enhancements and hiring more workers much harder. This is entirely avoidable. With the benefit of our budget surplus and unspent federal relief funds, Minnesota can finally do what over half of the other states have done, replenish unemployment insurance trust funds so businesses can focus their resources on making sure they're staying open, rebuilding, rehiring, and growing. But time is of the essence. We want to thank you all for standing here today and making sure that this fix is a priority. It's critical that we work to create economic opportunity and a full recovery in our state. A complete and clean wow. bill to prevent this payroll tax increase should be among one of the first orders of business of the legislature. And we're grateful that you're considering legislation to do that today. Because these efforts support workers, it will support businesses, and it will benefit our entire economy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schadhorst. Um, Matt Baumgartner's up next, and after that, in person, we have Kelton Glovey. Um, Matt Baumgartner from the Duluth Area Chamber of Commerce. I don't see him here. Are you online, maybe? I don't see Mr. Baumgartner. He had to go? OK. Um, so is Mr. Glevy here, Kelton Glevy? All right, we had to, he had to go, too. Um, I hope we have some online. Um, <laughs> Scott Farrell? Um, General Manager of Down in the Valley, are you on Zoom somewhere, Mr. Farrell? I don't see. Well, Senator Champion, I think we can give him all 10 minutes now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I know I saw uh, Ms. Kelly Gibbons. Um, we'll, and, if, and if Mr. Farrell just wave if, if when Kelly's done. Um, Ms. Gibbons, Executive Director of SEIU Local 284, welcome to the committee. Madam Chair, thank you so much and committee members. Did you say I had 10 minutes? No. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. So my name is Kelly Gibbons. I'm the Executive Director of SEIU Local 284 and I represent 10,000 school workers who work in um, public education and higher ed. We have been fighting, well, I've been fighting for 21 years for unemployment for workers. Here's me way back when applying for unemployment for hourly school workers. I have come full circle. I drove school bus and had to leave the profession because as a single mother, well, I drove for 18 years, but as a single mother, could no longer afford to stay working for a school district when I was unemployed every summer and constantly had to make up hours every paycheck because it's never full-time work, it's um, intermediate. Anyhow, these folks needed a safety net and with this pandemic, this pandemic has hurt those workers the worst and thousands of my members could not qualify for unemployment even though there was no work that they normally get. A lot of times there's work in the summer for bus drivers, paras, food service folks, but during the pandemic there wasn't any. Unemployment is a safety net for most employers who have seasonal workers, the so laborers, teamsters. Those are all positions that are mostly male dominated jobs, which I did, by the way, for five years. I worked at Schaefer Construction as a laborer. 
and uh, drove a, a tandem truck dump truck and always collected unemployment every single year. I always knew I was going to have work the next year, but in a school district, they don't get that same opportunity. There's a law that says you have reasonable assurance that you have a job the next year. I don't know why that law was ever put into place, but it's discriminatory in every single way. And, you know, bailing out these big corporations, some of these folks, the, the mom and pop shops, they really need the help. But, you know, Amazon and some of these big corporations, they don't really need the help. They made record profits. And yet, I know you can't discriminate against um, employers or companies, but yet we discriminate against workers who are mostly women and people of color in the school system. So, you know, I came here today to just talk about how do we support all workers in the state of Minnesota. Minnesota is one of the greatest states to live in and we have so many opportunities and we have this opportunity in this moment to ensure that every worker gets what they need to survive and help their um, their families strive. The one woman said, you know, she relies on unemployment um, five months out of the year for her workers. And, you know, school workers are three months out of the year and they don't get unemployment. And we just need to do better in Minnesota. We need to ensure that no matter where your zip code is and where you live, where you work, that everybody is protected with unemployment benefits. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Thank you so much, Ms. Gibbons. Um, next up, we have Eric Harris Bernstein, and after him, um, Dan Swenson Klatt. So, Mr. Harris Bernstein, Policy Director of We Make Minnesota. I don't. Oh, yay, you're there. Um, okay, go ahead, state your name for the record, and go ahead. Chair Housley, uh, members of the committee, uh, my name is Eric Bernstein, and, and as the chair said, I'm policy director for We Make Minnesota, uh, which is a coalition of labor and community groups organizing for a more just and equitable Minnesota. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm here to express some concerns with SF2677, which would channel $2.73 billion of state money towards um, refilling the state's unemployment insurance trust fund. Um, before going on, I'd like to put that figure just in a little bit of context. $2.7 billion is more than 10 percent of total 2022 general fund expenditures and double the entire year's spending on public safety and judiciary. Um, recently, Governor Walls proposed the large, largest bonding bill in state history. It would make historic and long-lasting investments in bridges, roads, housing, natural resources, transit, decades of back repairs on public assets, and much more. Um, and the total cost of all those investments is $2.7 billion. Um, corporate interests have asked that the state abandon its agreed-upon mechanism for trust fund repayment and instead use public dollars to cover their tax liabilities. That's not surprising, it's very understandable, but um, Minnesotans depend on the legislature to look after their best interests uh, and spend their tax dollars wisely. A UI tax cut will not benefit working Minnesotans, nor will it do anything to address the many pressing crises facing our state. Um, usually the demand for a corporate tax cut is tied to job creation, but jobs are plentiful right now. And in fact, the major economic challenge we face is a worker shortage resulting from underinvestment in the physical and social infrastructure that Minnesotans rely on to access the labor market. Uh, ironically, the needed investments in transit, childcare, and paid leave are exactly those th threatened if we spend our surplus on, you know, corporate handouts. Um, money in a business owner's pocket, of course, can be a very good thing, but in this case, the winners aren't those who need our help the most. Approximating based on total private sector employment, firms with more than 500 workers would receive nearly half of a UI bailout, while um, those firms with nine or fewer workers would get less than 10%. Scheduled UI tax increases can sound very large when stated as a percentage of current liabilities or without context of total revenues or payroll, but UI tax taxes are a relatively small line item. In 2019, the average tax rate on total wages was 0.54%. That's $6.17 on an average weekly wage of $1,143. So in this instance, a 30% increase would mean an additional $1.85 per worker per week. So Minnesota's largest corporations with thousands of employees will pocket millions, while average small businesses would save just a few bucks. Uh, multinationals like Walmart and Home Depot will win seven-figure sums, and this won't even stay in Minnesota. It'll just go to 
corporate profits for shareholders and executives around the world. Um, I really appreciate what Ms. Gibbons said about um, mom and pops that need our help. Um, I just think this is a really poor way to do it, uh, and it's a ton of money. Um, so all that's just to say it's unclear what benefit regular Minnesotans should expect to receive from this unprecedented use of billions of our dollars. And with so many crises, the labor shortage and many other things plaguing our state, I just think there's much, much better way to save, help local businesses and um, serve our community. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak today and everything you do. Thank you very much, Mr. Bernstein. And next up, we have Dan Swenson Klatt. And after that, we have in person John Reynolds. So go ahead, Mr. Swenson Klatt, announce your name for the tape. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Pratt and the committee. My name is Daniel Swenson Klatt. I own and operate Butter Bakery Cafe in South Minneapolis, uh, where I've had the business since January of 2006. We are an independent family business. We're truly a small business uh, with 20 employees. I am a member of the Main Street Alliance. Uh, we are a network of small businesses committed to seeing, our, seeing strong communities. And we know that communities are really the true engine of small business growth. So investing in our communities is an important piece of this. I appreciate the discussion around how to best support businesses during this time, and I'm concerned that simply refilling the UI Trust Fund will not go a long way in supporting the small businesses, like mine, that don't actually make claims on a UI fund. Uh, with rising prices and ongoing disruptions to supply chains, 2022 does not look promising uh, to make up for extensive losses of the past two years. Indeed, even though we as a business did have three months of revenue meeting expenses in 2021. Um, it was the grants, uh, 15,000 from Hennepin County, 15,000 from the state's COVID business payments relief and PPP funds that kept us open, allowed me to have my full staff on for the full year. We were working at reduced services and hours uh, and many other small businesses I knew couldn't even pull that off. As a small business owner, I know I'm not alone in saying targeted relief would benefit more of us than simple tax relief through the UI fund. I received $15,000 from the business relief payment grants at a time when I needed to keep going. The UI tax relief, it's going to save me $1,500 for a year. I just don't pay that much into it. We're a pretty small business. I've also advocated for paid family leave, which has felt like a much more useful way for me to put my money as a business owner. I currently do paid leave when we have cash. And as of this moment, I'm actually paying a cook four weeks of paid time so that he could care for his dying father and now bury him this weekend. That's money that I can't always offer. I don't have that kind of cash all the time. If there had been a paid family medical leave program in place, uh, rather than UI, where I'm not going to send them, I may have been able to offer that or even retain other employees who've needed health or medical leave time over the past years. That access is a more important investment than a UI fund replenishment. I do see a need for a strong business economy. We need to keep ourselves growing and even one that can withstand a pandemic. But I believe it's going to be through targeted relief rather than investments in a UI fund this way. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you so much, Mr. Swenson Klatt. Uh, next up, live and in person, we have John Reynolds with NFIB. Go ahead, Mr. Reynolds, announce your name for the record. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is John Reynolds. I'm the State Director for the National Federation of Independent Businesses in Minnesota. We're the state's largest small business organization with over 10,000 members in every corner of the state. Uh, over 75% of our members have fewer than 10 employees, and our mission is to advocate for the interests of Main Street businesses. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the committee for holding this hearing so quickly on such an important topic. Uh, I'd also like to thank Chair Pratt and the Governor and others uh, who have proposed fully repaying the UI debt that would otherwise be a drag on small businesses for years to come. Uh, a lot of small businesses are struggling right now. Uh, in recent NFIB surveys, 
A third of small businesses report that sales are still well below pre-pandemic levels. Over half reported lost sales due to worker shortages and almost three quarters lost sales due to supply chain issues. Additionally, over half of small business owners are increasing worker pay, paying more overtime, and taking on more hours themselves to try to keep up. On top of all that, as you've heard, they're now staring down large unemployment unemployment insurance tax increases. Uh, A small dental office in Rochester will pay five and a half times more than last year. A well driller in the West Metro will pay two and a half times more despite keeping their employees on through the pandemic. Uh, This isn't a few bucks. These are tens of thousands of dollars we're talking about here uh, that they're going to see in increases. Um, And many small businesses who did everything they could to scrape by during the last two years say this feels like death by a thousand cuts. Uh, Thankfully, as the governor and others recognize, the debt that's causing these tax increases was not the fault of small business owners. It was the fault of the pandemic and mitigation policies. And like Democrats and others, Democrats and Republicans in other states, uh, they believe that the state should play a role in rebuilding the UI system. Um, The UI system was just simply not built for pandemic-like events. It is self-regulating, but not for that type of catastrophic event. Indeed, has published many charts to that effect, which show an unbelievable uh, uh, downward slide in the trust fund balance. Um, And it's clear from NFIB's data that UI tax relief will enable small businesses to continue meeting the challenges in this moment and invest in their workforce. Uh, UI bills are due by April 30th, so we thank you for taking quick action and appreciate the opportunity to comment. Thank you so much, Mr. Reynolds. Members, any questions for any of the testifiers? Uh, Senator Putnam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do have a question for um, Ms. Gibbons, if I may, but um, given our collective occupation, I want to hear my own voice for a little while first before I get to it. Uh, And as I want to thank uh, Senator Pratt for allowing me to make my support of this proposition official by allowing me to co-author this bill. I think that it's incredibly important when faced with a crisis like this that we take it seriously and think long-term rather than simply in short-term. And I think that uh, uh, this is, in many ways, um, a required, necessary move. When we think about it as the resources that were paid out to help working Minnesotans throughout the course of the last uncomfortable past two years. But I would also like to suggest that in a moment like this of crisis, it's also an opportunity to think about not just how to fix what was going on in the past, but how we might do things better uh, in the future. And I was just visiting with Senator Rarick before the committee meeting started about school districts in the rest of the country who have had to close down and go to virtual learning because they just don't have enough school bus drivers. And that's just one component of uh, the kinds of workforce problems that we've got uh, as a direct result of some of our concerns that we're facing right now. You know, my uh, spouse is the incoming superintendent of public schools in St. Cloud. And every morning, I hear her trying to get Paris to work somewhere and moving people around from one building to the next because there just are not enough Paris and school bus drivers in our communities right now for a number of different reasons. So my question for you, Ms. Gibbons, is do you think that if were we to take this crisis that we face as also an opportunity to rethink how we do unemployment insurance and we were to think about extending some of these resources and these opportunities to people who are non-licensed staff in the public schools, Given the multiple reasons for why we have these shortages, do you think that extending uh, uh, and developing unemployment benefits for these non-licensed staff would actually help with our workforce problem that we're experiencing in tandem with the unemployment problem? Thank you, Senator Putnam. Ms. Gibbons. So, yes, I do. I think it would attract and it would retain uh, quality workers Uh, One of our bus drivers uh, was supposed to actually um, come and testify today, but for some reason she wasn't um, allowed to come to this meeting. She got kicked off or something. But, you know, she is saying that she's going to have to uh, quit her job at the school district also because she lives on credit cards for the summer, and she can no longer do that. And most of these workers... You know, when you work for a school district and you're off in June and then you don't come back till September, nobody wants to hire you because you're only going to be there probably three months. And if you're lucky, you'll stay at the other place. But, you know, realistically, that's what we've been saying all along is, you know, if we had unemployment benefits for these workers, I, I believe, and it would have kept me 
in the school district because I loved what I did. I drove bus for 18 years. I loved the kids. I loved the community. I knew every child by every name. I knew when their parents were getting home, when they weren't home, if they needed to be picked up. And this is what our workers do in the schools. They are, are the second parents for the kids. And they come to these, these jobs because they really like what they do, but they're no longer jobs that people can stay working at because they don't have enough money. You know, you have house payments and car payments and children and whatever, and they just don't have that safety net. So I think, yes, if, that, if we extended those benefits, we would attract and, and retain employees. People are walking out the door right now because they can go work somewhere else year, you know, 12 months out of the year and make more money and have more stability. So we want stability for our children. We should have stabi stability for our workers too. Thank you, Ms. Gibbons. Yes. Um, Senator Rarick, you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question is for Mr. Redding, if he could come back up and, and while he's making his way up, you know, I want to say, um, in our last uh, hearing, uh, we heard from the department that if we do nothing, this is going to take uh, over a decade to uh, get the get back to where we can start lowering these assessments. And uh, uh, Mr. Redding, I guess, if uh, your industry as a whole um, sees these type of rates for the next 10 plus years, do you anticipate that you'll uh, continue on at the type of employment numbers that you have, or is your industry going to find ways to operate with fewer people? Mr. Redding with Ally Restaurants. Thank you. Um, and that's a fantastic question. I can tell you from my personal standpoint, um, I will close another restaurant and possibly two of them. Um, but from an industry standpoint, you know, we're facing worker shortages the way it is. And with added costs, um, we would be forced to look at um, robotics, um, um, ways to do more with less labor, uh, labor pool, um, whether it's robotics in the kitchens or, um, you know, order yourself at the table, um, all sorts of, of technology to be able to help us uh, continue in the hospitality industry taking care of people um, and, and giving them a great time, um, but not employing people to do so. Thank you, Mr. Redding. Members, any other questions? Senator Dreheim. Thanks, Chair. Um, and thank you, Senator Pratt, for bringing this bill forward. I know there was a bunch of different options on, on how to solve this problem. But I just wanted to give a little more perspective from another business owner. Um, you know, most of us had uh, shutdowns with COVID, and, and we did get some help with some programs, depending on what industry you're in. Um, but the new normal is quite a bit of increase in pay, which in the long run is great uh, for the employees. But energy prices have gone way up. The supply chain issues. And, and, and when you run a business, you have vendors you like to do business with. And, and you structure whatever you're selling based off of your input costs. Well, if you can't control your input costs, it really hurts your margin. And in a lot of industries that, that I have visited with, they're just begging for raw material and, and supplies and they can't control the price or the availability of products. So you have higher labor, higher insurance costs, and something we haven't talked about. Commercial insurance has gone way up. So if you own a commercial business or commercial building, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so there's every input for running a business has been increased, and, and I know in, in the big spreadsheet, unemployment insurance isn't the largest expense. But when you're losing money, um, it, it might be the difference between retaining another employee or not. So I, I'm just grateful that uh, we are having this discussion. I'm grateful that 
the House is going to have this discussion, and I'm really grateful that the governor is willing to uh, move forward, hopefully sooner than later. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Jahan. Senator Rarick. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, you know, uh, thank you, Senator Pratt, for bringing this forward. I know you and I have been uh, talking about this for over a year, uh, seeing this coming and trying to get people on board uh, to understand what, what was going to happen. And, uh, you know, the $2.73 billion that we're talking about in this bill, understand that's not even the extent of the amount that was paid out to workers during this time. Businesses continued to pay in the entire time. This $2.73 billion represents the amount of money that was paid out to the average worker who was either laid off because of the shutdowns or laid off because uh, work was just unable to be done. So this benefit already went out to the workers. And in the very beginning, when we started talking about what we needed to do to protect people because of the pandemic, we told businesses, we are not going to hold you responsible. Lay your people off as needed. They will be able to collect unemployment and we are not going to hold you responsible for those expenses. If we do not do what we're talking about with this bill, then we're not following through with what we promised. It's as simple as that. There are a lot of other issues that we've heard about uh, along with this, and we're whether it's worker training, whether it's um, other folks with UI, these are all important issues and these are all going to be talked about as we go along, but that doesn't mean we hold this up because of it. This needs to go through. We have March 15th as a deadline to make it happen because we start looking at the next year's process in mid-March. All of the other issues we continue to talk about, I'm the chief author of a few of them. I am not going to let them just disappear and fall under the rug. Um, but this one is something that we know about, we've known about it for a long time, and we can address it right now and get this done and move on to the other issues. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Rarick. Any other members? Um, Senator Pratt, I just have a quick question. If I know the governor has said that, that this money's needed to ensure that the businesses across the state are held harm, harmless, and so he's all on board with this. Um, and getting this done quickly by March 15th. But if it gets held up in the House, I don't know if you know where they're at in the House with this or what the appetite is over there, but if this doesn't pass by March 15th and get to the governor's desk, what's what will happen here to our businesses and our, our small businesses and our employees and to the state? Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And, and uh, Representative Pulowski is our, our uh, author in the House, and, and it's my understanding he's got a number of colleagues from both sides of the aisle that are, are signing on to the bill. Uh, I know there's a hearing going on today about, uh, about various uh, UI repayment proposals, which include uh, policy changes like we've been talking about today. Um, I had been asked to include some policy changes favorable to the business community. I chose not to do that. This is a clean bill about shoring up our unemployment system as it is. Um, and, and to get it passed. And, and so uh, I will continue to work with Representative Pulowski and, and hope that the House uh, comes to an agreement, but uh, he made it very clear today that uh, he believes that this should be a clean bill that goes through without uh, any attachments to it. Thank you. All right, members, if there's no more questions, Senator Pratt, do you want to make a motion? Uh, thank you, Madam. Chair, and, and maybe just a, a, a couple of quick closing comments. I appreciate the discussion. Um, a couple of people you, you talked to and uh, or mentioned that uh, I had a chance to talk to today. Uh, Mr. Glovey, uh, I've, I've actually known Mr. Glovey for many, many years. Uh, he was an essential business. He didn't have to lay anybody off, and yet his uninsurance tax is going up uh, by almost 30%. Uh, Rebecca Hagstrom uh, was with us at uh, a, a bipartisan press conference earlier today. Uh, she runs Liberty Academy out of White Bear Lake. Her unemployment insurance bill is going up 450%. She used to pay $6,000 a year. She's now going to have to pay $33,000 a year. She's in the middle of her financial 
uh, her fiscal year. She can't just pass that cost along to her parents. She's going to have to make cuts and changes that that affect students. You know, I was kind of I was moved by by Mr. Redding's testimony, where he kept people on payroll and and uh, help help cover their their benefits, and yet he's going to end up paying this increase as well. And that's what this is about. This is about shoring up the unemployment system to make sure it's there to protect working Minnesotans when they need it most. And while we can have all sorts of policy discussions, just like we did last year when we talked about uh, unemployment for senior citizens and unemployment for uh, uh, school kids, we continue to have those discussions. We shouldn't bog down this bill. The fact of the matter is, members, we're only one of 10 states that owes the U.S. Treasury for unemployment debt right now. And 31 other states have already used some of their CARE and, and ARPA funds to help pay down this debt. When Congress passed these laws, they intended us to use them for these purposes, and we should. And so, Madam Chair, I would uh, move that we pass Senate File 2677 as amended and refer to finance. Members, Senator Pratt makes the motion to pass Senate File 2677 as amended. Madam Chair, uh, just real quick, and I do want to thank Senator Rarick, Senator Putnam, as well as Senator Duckworth and Senator Rosen for co-sponsoring the bill with me. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Pratt makes a motion for Senate File 2677 as amended to pass and move to finance. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Your bill passed and you're on to finance, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, I think that is all we have on the agenda. Uh, thank you so much for coming. And um, Senator Pratt will be your chair for the next meeting. And as of that, we are adjourned.